Audio, audio. <laughs> Welcome to On The Chain. This is Jeff. We are here live on a Sunday morning with our coffee. Make sure you go out and get your espresso because today we are going to be talking about Ripple XRP 22 and beyond. So 2022 and beyond. This is the key of the topic tonight. That's from NFTs to CBDCs. Um, the Ledger City. We're going to go through the Ledger. What is the Ledger City? The first XRP metaverse? Can you really own land in this uh, XRP world? Uh, and so I want to get into that a little bit because it is like one week away from registration date of the Ledger City. Is it going to be a success, success or is it going to flop? You know, is it going to be short term and, you know, and and have these massive massive gains kind of like the crypto kitty or is it going to get out there and compete with decentraland and many of the others and really vying for positioning for some of these big conglomerates out there investing their money into the metaverse so what's up with all the metaverse talk and the collapse of facebook's meta their uh the stockholders, uh, you know, lashing back at this notion of moving Facebook over into the metaverse and changing its name to something that no one's going to remember to the meta. <laughs> I don't know. Anyhow, there's a ton of things that I want to dig into, including a Ripple paper that has come out talking about what is going to happen here in 2020. Too. So want to get into all of that. So if you guys are ready to kick this thing off, Sir John, we're going to get into that as well with those original screenshots. So let's see here. What do we got? Do we got something? Do we have a way to kick this thing off? All right, here we go. Welcome to On The Chain. All right. Espresso in hand. Whoa, it was full and it's hot. Hmm. Didn't realize they filled it up so much. <laughs> right to the top. Oh, great. Okay, so here we go. Where, where are we going to start? I think, you know where I want to start is this idea now that, so we've seen a lot of associations. We've seen a lot of partnerships rising up. Uh, with Ripple around the world. Obviously, we know where the SEC stands, not just on Ripple, but also on XRP. Uh, it's really important to see that, you know, there's been a lot of conversation recently. There was a, some articles that had come back, uh, come out in March of 2021, and those are all beginning to resurface again, that, uh, that Ripple utilizing XRP uh, is going to become a bridge for for CBDCs around the world. Now, this was, you know, an article that's already, or this uh, discussion point that's already a year old and it's beginning to resurface. However, what isn't resurfacing and what is new is that, yes, there are multiple, uh, multiple uh, new partnerships and new associations that are popping up all over the place. And one of those new associations that is popping up and we're going to get into this here a little bit right now is um, the Digital Euro Association. So yes, the Digital Euro Association. And this is, you know, important and, you know, there's going to be multiples that we discuss here. And so this one in specific, why is it important? Well, uh, because the Digital Association and here's Ripple joining the Digital Euro Association is a supporting partner to further develop our work with CBDCs. Now, you know, Chip and I have discussed this notion of decentralization versus centralization, decentralization pushing into freedoms, centralization pushing into, oh, more centralization. So here, uh, still, as we know, the CBDCs are going to become walled gardens. They might be great in the country that they're being derived in. They might be great in the regional uh, uh, sphere of influence uh, that that country uh, may have. But beyond that, uh, you're still going to have to have transaction 
from one CBDC to another. Now, I'm not going to knock a government or a central bank for wanting to maintain the sovereignty of their currency, uh, which is also an extension to the sovereignty of their of their country uh, and the and the control of that country. So, getting beyond that, though, okay. So now you have the centralized, controlled currency of that one specific area. How do you then transact where it would be different from what we have right now? So if you have a digital version of the US dollar that is regulated and controlled by the Fed, uh, why is that any different than paper fiat? Right now, a lot of our currency is ones and zeros. And yet that ones and zero technology um, is still extremely slow and monotonous, mainly because there still is a manual settlement process when you're moving money across border, if you're moving it from one zone to the next. So now if you have a CBDC, how is that going to be any different if there is no interoperability between these centrally banked digital currencies? And as we're already seeing, Countries that are discussing digital currency, some of them are moving towards a blockchain-based solution, and some of them, like with the digital yuan, are completely not. Uh, they're just digital uh, versions that are completely programmable money that are also then completely controllable and manipulatable uh, by the government. And so here you have the dilemma. So now how do you take all of these CBDCs and get them to, to communicate with one another if you don't have interoperability? And this is exactly where the Ripple, a RippleNet solution comes in and the ODL solution. So now if you can help support uh, the CBDCs that inevitably are going to come about, there's no way we can stop it. It's going to happen. Um, you have an organization, an entity like Ripple that understands it very uh, clearly, very succinctly, uh, that the CBDCs are going to come about. And we've even seen in the U.S. the the Fed pushing back against this notion of the U.S. dollar, a digital dollar. And then in the same breath, they're already making an allowance and creating the environment to roll it out. So now when you understand, you know, from that perspective, so here we go, you need to have some sort of interconnectivity, interoperability between these different digital currencies, you have to have a world in which you have the stable coins and the, and the cryptocurrencies that are out there and existing because a lot of these projects uh, will rely on that. And so here you have Ripple understanding the broader scope and the broader vision of what's happening. And so joining with the Digital Euro Association said, this is one part of our larger goal to develop and deliver global solutions for CBDCs and stable coins through our blockchain and crypto expertise. Now, the one thing that in the US they have not done very well is actually reaching out to those companies that have the expertise in rolling out blockchain and cryptocurrency. What they have done is push back and attack the experts, supposedly on behalf of the retail investor. Yet in the rest of the world, like with the Digital Euro Association, if you just look at their Twitter, the Digital Euro Association is a think tank specializing in crypto assets, stable coins, central bank digital currencies, and other forms of digital money. So, whoa, almost burned myself again on this coffee. Hang on. So the Digital Euro Association is also very excited and they're fired up to be joining uh, partnerships here. Uh, thrilled to share that Ripple has joined the DEA. Now, DEA, uh, in this case, the Digital Euro Association. As a supporting partner, Ripple is one of the leading providers of enterprise blockchain and crypto solutions for cross-border payments. Welcome to the DEA community again, Digital Euro Association. Ripple, supporting partner of the DEA. And then we're going to get into this uh, blog post here in one second. Uh, but this is actually a very, very important step. So what we're seeing around the world is that we're beginning to see regulatory clarity solidifying itself, cementing itself from country 
to country, not in the U.S., because the U.S. still has a significant lack of clarity. Um, around the world, however, um, we are starting to see this cohesion uh, of bringing stablecoin and cryptocurrency to the mainstream through normal conversation, not through um, enforcement, not through Gary Gensler's pillars of enforcement, not through legal action, but through conversation, through discussion, uh, through analyzing and working. Guess what? Working with the experts. What a notion. What a notion. Work with the experts that truly understand digital asset, cryptocurrency. Work with experts that have been in this since the beginning that understand how to uh, develop and build this out. So here you have the Digital Euro Association now announcing this partnership to them obviously is a big deal because Ripple is one of the biggest players. Now, could you imagine if you take an organization like the Digital Euro Association and they look over at Ripple and say, hey, you know what? The SEC in the US is suing you. They're going after you. They're going after members or holders, retail holders of XRP because they've singled out XRP amongst all the thousands of digital assets. The SEC has singled out one company, one asset. While we already know, and it's now been shown multiple times over in video and in print, that the SEC has been very uh, nonchalant or accepting in verbal statements, again, the written statement on Bitcoin and Ethereum, yet again, targeting and singling out another digital asset. Now, the difference and distinction between the digital assets is, is obvious. Um, when you have Ripple that is really taking on a life of its own into mainstream, a, a mainstream area where some of these bigger players, this is, this, is, this is their playground, moving money across borders, controlling the flow of finance. Now, Ripple is stepping their toe and has been stepping their toe into this, disrupting SWIFT that is controlled as a conglomerate by banks from around the world that big governments also have a say-so in terms of what SWIFT does or what SWIFT doesn't. Now, if we thought that there would be no pushback, then you know we're kind of crazy. So we knew there was going to be pushback. Now, if there is no pushback, then your idea has very little significance. If there's major pushback and major competition, then you know you're onto something and you're doing something right, that you're doing something game-changing. Now, Ripple knows that what they're doing is something significant and game changing and the digital euro association that is growing up uh over in europe why because regulatory clarity is on the shores of the european nations at this moment they understand the significance of this innovative asset class while there is resistance and pushback from government officials in the u.s that are trying to manipulate and control and fight over the control of who has the say in the direction of this new innovative asset. So the Digital Euro Association and in partnership with Ripple, because now Europe is kind of the direction, Asia as well, but right now this is the direction. So they're happy to announce this partnership with Ripple as a supporting partner to jointly work on central bank digital currencies. Again, central versus decentralized, but Ripple, one of the leading providers of enterprise blockchain and crypto solutions for cross-border payments, has recently developed a blockchain-based infrastructure to support CBDCs and is engaged with Bhutan Central Bank, amongst others, as we've talked about, uh, to help execu execute their CBDC pilot. Ripple is also a member of the Digital Pound Foundation and continues to extend its efforts around CBDCs worldwide. Why? Because they see an opening. They see this opportunity 
with the CBDCs. Again, think about the walled gardens. Think about the fact that it is now a foregone conclusion that world that countries around the world are going to roll out their CBDCs and Ripple is positioning themselves perfectly to be the software solution to move it. And now let's not forget about ODL because we're going to talk again about ODL and we're going to remind ourselves what ODL is. And then we're going to look further into this idea that since Ripple is also built on the XRP ledger using uh, or the Ripple net is utilizing the XRP ledger, the significance of what that is and what else is happening in the space with the XRP ledger. So the DEA partnership with Ripple includes, amongst others, joint educational efforts around digital currencies and knowledge exchange. So, so imagine that joint education. Now, again, these are two entities and, and now they're moving over into Europe. And we have a lack of a desire in the United States within uh, government to have education efforts or knowledge exchange. <laughs> so that's kind of uh, you know, an issue. Um, I want to say, give a huge shout out right now to Crypto Eddie. Appreciate you being on here with us. Uh, great to see you here. I know many times you're kind of behind, you know, listening and, and watching, but uh, also to DNI coming over to us from Thailand, Crypto Eddie, all the way in from Japan. Uh, so really great stuff. And also just a shout out here to Hans Loaded. Hans Loaded has been doing a great effort in uh, editing and helping to produce uh, segments from our live streams that we're posting up on the other channel in little eight to 10 minute blocks. And those are fine, you know, getting a little bit of traction. Uh, we're trying to push and grow that side of uh, that other channel. But so Hans Lode is saying the U.S. government will need to be in control of Ripple in the future if they intend to continue sanctioning countries as they have been. Now, they don't necessarily have to be in control of Ripple, uh, but Ripple has to have um, a U.S. based uh, presence. And then there has to be, you know, from a legal perspective, they have to have a level of influence um, over over Ripple. So I guess, you know, they don't necessarily have to be 100 percent in control of, but they have to have a, uh, a an influence, <laughs> a level of influence. Now, if Ripple is to be pushed offshores and Ripple and RippleNet then becomes a, a global uh company or regional to somewhere else other than the U.S., uh, that could be a little bit more difficult. And then the U.S. would then put pressure on whichever country uh, they reside in. Uh, but the idea of RippleNet isn't to help uh, rogue nations and terrorist supporting nations circumvent the process. That isn't what RippleNet is all about. Um, and there still has to be a level of decorum amongst these companies. This isn't, you know, some... Uh, you know, company, you know, trying to uh, push into anarchy. Um, they are still trying to stay within the norms of our of our society, uh, but yet also uh, doing it from a perspective uh, that will help those that are actually trying to move the asset. Because right now we know that Swift is antiquated and outdated um, and doesn't work for anyone. Uh, and that it does have a level of manipulation being that it's controlled by the banking uh, conglomerates, you know, and obviously the U.S. government has some influence uh, there as well. So, but DNI is saying Hans loaded controlling Ripple doesn't control XRP. Plus, countries can shift other assets like gold. Simple Russia and China are already doing it. Europe is doing it also. Instex, and that that's a great point because they can also do it with the movement of gold. They can do it with the movement of oil. They can do it with a lot of things. Uh, they don't necessarily need U.S. currency or other currency fiat currency to do it. So, you know, great, great commentary there. Glad you guys brought that up. Uh, so here, uh, just going back here, whoops, wrong, wrong screen to zoom in on. Okay. We're thrilled that due to this partnership, uh, we can ex uh, with Ripple, we can extend the technological expertise, expertise of the DEA community as more and more CBDC projects worldwide reach advanced stages. Technological design of a CBDC will play a key role for policymakers in the near future and other countries anyways, while previous years focused primarily on research. So now we're moving from research stage to actual rollout, to rollout stage. So that is, that's huge. You know, that is really, really amazing. So here's the about. We don't have to get too uh, 
crazy into what those are uh, what those are about. So, you know, good stuff on the horizons uh, with that. And then, so when we look, we're like, wow, is that is that it? Is that all Ripple is up to? You know, like what else could Ripple be doing in the interim while the SEC has filed lawsuit? against Ripple, are they going to sit back and do absolutely nothing? And, and obviously, you know, Chip and I have talked about some of the progress that Ripple has made, you know, and again, focusing in on this idea of why is, you know, Ripple and the RippleNet software solution important, you know, not because it's a money mover, but because they're utilizing uh, the XRPL and, you know, they have built their solution utilizing the technology, um, but also rolling out ODL. Now ODL is little by little, uh, you know, gaining some some influence in some areas, and ODL is the on-demand liquidity, which is really the game changer for moving money all over the place. And everybody is concerned about liquidity and movement of funds, and the liquidity aspect is what streamlines and makes it. It's it's kind of it's the oil uh, to the engine. So without the ODL, without the liquidity, and in this case, on-demand liquidity, without liquidity. There's no engine movement uh, within finance. So this makes it better. This is a, you know, a synthetic, <laughs> let's say it's a synthetic oil. So your engine parts work much better um, with less friction. And so imagine, you know, with RippleNet and their ODL, that is the synthetic oil that you're putting into your into your engine that you only have to change every 15 to 16,000 miles uh, versus what they recommend with standard oil. What is that like? Three to four thousand miles, eight thousand miles. Even though you know you can probably get more than that, but the idea here is that you know this synthetic oil that is really amazing, lubricating the engine parts so that it performs to its peak uh, and and efficiency. So so that's really great. So now let's uh let's look at this right here. Hang on a second. Whoops, I almost removed it, but. Let me take a look at some of the commentary here. We have we have great people that that show up here. This is Sunday morning instead of Saturday morning. So in some places, like over in Japan and over in Thailand, it's actually Monday morning. A lot of times, you know, it's weekend for everybody when we do this Saturday. But since it's you know there were some things going on yesterday, I was at a workshop. Today is Super Bowl weekend over here in the U.S., so we're not going to have a show tonight at 8 p.m. And tomorrow's Valentine's Day, so we decided to postpone tomorrow and then we're gonna come back on Tuesday. But then I moved today. I said, you know what? Since I couldn't do yesterday, we'll do today. Now. Oh, that coffee is good. You know what the problem is? Some of the coffee shops you go in, I don't know if it's like a millennial thing, a millennial thing, but if you get like a good rich, you know, uh, Italian coffee, you know, it's, it's just got a lot of body to it. You know, it, it tastes good. And then for some reason, this this new concept is like a new vogue in the U.S. And I haven't really seen it anywhere else. But their coffee, their espresso is bitter and it it almost tastes like there's lemon in it. And I and I've mentioned this to multiple people that, you know, when they're making, I said there's either you're not cleaning your espresso maker properly, you know, or maybe it's the extraction process and how they're grinding their beans. But there's something going on. But people seem to like like this real bitter lemony you know, flavor. And it's not like exclusive to one location. It's everywhere. Yesterday I was down in Coral Gables, Miami, and there's a coffee shop there. I forget what it was called. And you go in and you pick the type of coffee that you want. And I'm like, I want espresso. And they're like, okay, well, what kind of espresso? I said, the kind that you put in a cup. I mean, what does that mean? What kind of espresso? There's only one kind and you can get a single or you can get a double. Um, in a lot of places, they just give you your espresso and it comes in a cup and it's perfect. Um, and so, but they had like 10 different coffee beans to choose from up on the wall. There might've been more than that, maybe 12, I don't know. And so you had to look and read and look at the different aromas and, uh, you know, uh, acidic uh, levels and everything. So you're looking at the coffee beans and you choose your coffee bean, they grind it up and then they make your coffee. And I had it Friday and I had it yesterday and I had different types and both of them had that same lemony kind of bitter flavor to it. So it's not the coffee bean. It's got to be their machines. And it's like, it's like an epidemic. It's like a, the pandemic of the bad espresso around the U S and man, it's so problematic for me, but anyhow, uh, I digress. Uh, so evil carrot said, 
Did no one at the SEC know that uh, Garlinghouse talked to Roisman back in 18? <laughs> the discussion, isn't that crazy, uh, Carrot? You know, it's insane, right? We look at the SEC and I say, you know, I know Chip and I have discussed it and I know we brought it up on the show, but I, we look at this and we say, let's see, the SEC files a lawsuit. Did they not talk in depth to each one of the, the chairmen? I know Roisman was against dropping the lawsuit, but at the time, didn't they say, hey, did anybody have any conversation uh, with Ripple? Uh, because we're going to drop this lawsuit. And we know that, you know, Hinman and and Clayton, you know, those guys, you know, they they themselves should say, hey, we know we've made some statements that are on video uh, and in print uh, about uh, Ethereum and, and Bitcoin. So maybe this isn't the right direction to move in. Uh, and uh, Roisman, you know, didn't you have a conversation with Garling House? And, you know, haven't we had any other action or activity regarding the Ethereum Foundation? Maybe maybe we should rethink the, the position here. That's why I always believed, and I told Chip, I think there's a lot more to this lawsuit uh, than what we see on its face. And there's things that we'll probably never know uh, from a power struggle pol uh, perspective and a political uh, perspective that's going on somewhere behind the scenes that uh, might have a lot to do with the banks, might have a lot to do with SWIFT, uh, might have a lot to do with things that we don't know from a, a regulatory control perspective. You know, we can, you know, guess at it, you know, but it does not make any sense. And and I think there's a lot of these inconsistencies uh, that we're seeing, or maybe it's just that government officials are just inefficient. I mean, that that's also probable that government officials just aren't as, you know, uh, we, we try to put government officials sometimes up on a pedestal as though they operate outside of human nature, you know, but maybe they're infallible or they're, they're, uh, you know, not, they're not infallible, uh, you know, humans, and maybe they are subjected to more error, uh, because they believe the same thing that they're on this pedestal and they have so much power that they disregard things that normal people would regard as significant. Um, and maybe that's why government officials make so many bad decisions um, because of that fact. And they think that every one of their decisions is gold and isn't shit. And it's the exact opposite, that many of their decisions are actually crap and very few of their decisions are positive. Maybe that's the reality. Um, and maybe that's what we need to stick to that they just do things that are dumb. I mean, I mean, that's possible too. And then there's a interconnectivity of all of those elements where there's ulterior motive, there's politics, there's stupidity, uh, there's, you know, conniving, you know, uh, uh, jockeying for, for power. I mean, there's all these things going on uh, when there's, the, you know, when, when we see, you know, activity uh, within the political echelon, uh, so to speak. Uh, and many of it will always be tracked back to money. Almost always. You can always draw the dots back to money. And then you have to look at it after the fact, not just during, because a lot of the uh, contribution to that individual, the so-called pat on their back, well, let's say when they make a decision, they get the pat on the back. When they come out of office, when they come out of whether it's an appointed office, or an elected office, that's the payback. And it's very, you know, and obviously you see them, they have position of power, they have the ear of many big officials, they get hired into huge uh, board positions, and they end up getting paid millions of dollars on the out when they come out. And whether that's, you know, something nefarious or just something smart for them to do, well, there you go. So Chris was saying, hi, guys, listening from Great Britain. Can I uh, ask a question on your show, please? Well, yes. OK, what is happening with the executive order from Biden? Can you discuss this when it's out, when it's due? How? So the executive order, I don't know where what the status is. Um, that's something that we'll have to dig into. I believe that there's a lot more, too, when they drop these executive orders. Some of them, again, are just, you know, power plays. Um, I believe that, you know, they must be analyzing, you know, the detrimental impact 
of what that executive order is going to mean. Um, I executive orders are so useless. <laughs> you know, I mean, you think about you drop an executive order and then the next administration basically with a stroke of a pen deletes your executive order. And so, and any action that was derived thereof is now gone. Uh, so if they're going to do this through executive order, it's stupidity. Uh, and if they do it through executive order, it's going to be detrimental uh, to the entire space in the US, not from a global perspective, but really, you know, what can they do with the executive order? I think yeah, at the end of the day, um, they're going to put, you know, through an executive order, if they end up going through with it, I believe it's going to be more of a, a uh, hey, guys, get together and discuss it and figure it out. Uh, between the CFTC and the SEC and maybe create work groups. I, I don't know. I mean, that's what the Congress, the, you know, the only bill that's really passed through and then it got stuck up in the Senate is, oh, let's go discuss. So, go, let's create a work group so we can discuss it more. So Congress was really built to do things really, really slowly because if yeah, things happen too fast, then obviously it could be detrimental. Um, but at the same time, the way those cogs move, they move so slowly that when you want action on something like this, it doesn't happen quickly. And then the, 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 again, going back to what we were just saying about the politicians, you know, they're with their stupidity and, you know, they'll, they'll take and their superiority complex, they'll take, you know, these ideas and notions and cram them into legislation that's thousands and thousands of pages long. And they'll hide something like they did with that, uh, quasi infrastructure bill and they they crammed uh crypto into the this quasi infrastructure bill and tried to call it uh, uh infrastructure for crypto and, and it was more punitive uh towards crypto and so you know but that's something that we're, we will dig into so appreciate that you brought it up chris but we definitely need to talk about that and just stay on what they're doing because whatever whatever they do is you know is is ridiculous anyways but um, anyhow, uh, Ahmed, American government hypocrisy is so unreal. They criticize developing countries about corruption <laughs> and lack of justice. But on the other hand, uh, the U.S. has the SEC. Hmm. That's a that's a great point, Ahmed. Uh, you know, I, and you know, the one thing that we're seeing, and I'll tell you what, you know, over the past year, uh, is that so much of this is now out in the open. So a year ago, um. Uh, much of this was hidden in the, in the, you know, and, and surrounded, uh, in darkness. Uh, and so now, and, and people talked about it though, <laughs> you know, they, they talked about what was going on with the fed. They talked about the wrangling of the politicians. They talked about the deception within Congress. They talked about, you know, how, uh, congressional representatives are making millions of dollars, uh, through investment. Uh, and, you know, and, and they're not, they weren't being held bound to uh, insider trading uh, laws and things like that. And now all of this is in, in front of us. Now it's, it's being, it's like a massive, massive spotlight on what's happening. We can thank in part uh, crypto uh, and the crypto community has been amazing. Also, when we saw what was going on with the infrastructure bill, but the crypto community is just the latest community to wake up. Uh, to this notion uh, that the SEC and many within the U.S. government are have actually been working contrary to uh, the benefit of this innovative asset class and the benefit of retail investors and really working on the other side to benefit uh, other entities uh, and not doing what their uh, set mission and goal uh, is, which is to protect retail investors. And obviously we know with Gary Gensler coming in and he talks about the pillars of enforcement and oh, by the way, I'm here to help protect the retail investors. No, it, you know, it's, it's just the hypocrisy, you know, reeks, it reeks, <laughs> it does. And it's, it's crazy. You know, it's crazy, man. So we got here evil carrot. So the evil carrot is espresso latte caramel, choco bitter agave creamy with a sprinkle of lemon zest. <laughs> That's you know what? Give me some uh, just straight espresso with nothing in it. Well, I'll tell you what. Last night after dinner, uh, we went. Uh, we're down in 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 Hollywood. Have you been in in downtown Hollywood outside of Fort Lauderdale? Um, there is a gelato shop over there owned by an Italian family. 
And I'll tell you what, they have an Italian espresso. They sell the, the coffee over there as well. But it is rich and it's good. And we had some of that espresso last night and it was just like spot on perfect. Uh, really, really perfect espresso, especially when it was just like, you know, a little bit of good gelato, you know, and also a little bit of uh, good espresso is perfect. So Darcy, we'll be back in a second. Just need to have an espresso, <laughs> an espresso at, you know, one. Uh, yeah, we'll be back after these messages. So, yeah, Switzerland has great espresso. I agree with that, Oscon. Man, I love Switzerland. Switzerland's a great place. Um, I love coming over there. Um, and then the, la the last trip, now it's been like uh, going on almost uh, two years because of all this nonsense. So haven't really been able to travel overseas, but I'm um, looking forward to coming back over there because you're right. Coffee was really good. Coffee in Germany, not so good. Coffee in Switzerland was good. Coffee in Italy, obviously, really good. So Sir John, I like non too acidic, stronger, robust. See, if you get a really good robust, it's got to, it's got to have that full body to it. You know, it can't be too thin, can't be too bitter. It's just like you get that perfect mix and, and you roast it on the stove, you know, in a mocha pot and it's the best. It's just, it's just the best. Yep. And van life. See, this is the problem. Like coffee shop to coffee shop to coffee shop. I believe the same thing. Now I had Fort Lauderdale, downtown Fort Lauderdale, um, there's a place called uh, Flagler something, Flagler Village, I think it's called. Yeah, it's kind of like um, um, Wynwood in Miami, uh, but in Fort Lauderdale. And they also had a coffee shop. Same thing. I went to have the coffee over there and it was the exact same thing. It was like, God, it was it was so problematic. And it, it must be that they they don't clean it and the millennials just don't know any better and you drink it. But now it's all of a sudden it's growing on me. I'm like, holy crap. Now, if you have a dirty espresso, I'm like, you know, no. <laughs> Einrich Ray, good afternoon from Cape Town, XRP. The SEC is hoping the uh, Ripple will come to the table, settle on their terms. But Ripple is standing up to the bully. That's that's a, exactly it. Why there can't really be a, uh, a massive uh, settlement. So, Mark, appreciate it. No nonsense. <laughs> No nonsense, even with a coffee. So let's see, I'm going down the list here. Mark Ham, the Ripple SEC lawsuit is obvious to everyone except the judge at this point. Uh, there's no one to blame except the judge for allowing the circus to continue. And then we obviously have some important things going on, I believe, this month and, and a lot of other things uh, that are transpiring. But DNI and DNI knows uh, there are government employees and there are civilians who the government people believe are beneath them. Whoa, look at that. Look at, look at that statement. I know that's, you, got, you know, we're a little bit behind uh, the eight ball here on the commentary, uh, but man. So uh, let's see, they they had all the freedom to do. This is uh, Darren uh, Diga, Diga, Dar, Darren uh, Digalormo. Digalormo? Digalormo. I think I got that. Uh, they had all the freedom to do whatever they wanted that benefited them. But now we have figured out the internet and social media. And now we can see the truth. There you go. See, see how it grows. And this is internet. This is on a global, a global scale. It's all over the place, everywhere, everywhere we go. So one day, Simon will have gone full Apple. <laughs> and, and he'll be wearing a black turtleneck with jeans for every live show chip from now on the uh the otc uniform is a black turtleneck and jeans <laughs> oh my god that's so funny we got uh force dc good afternoon from amsterdam welcome good to see you here with us Uh, let's see. The U.S. likes to point out others while their own politics is corrupted. Unfortunately, um, Ahmed, fintech and crypto companies should get together and leave the U.S. in mass. Hey, you know what? You know, we see what's going on up in Canada, right, with the uh, freedom truckers. And um, obviously, we've seen the response to them. These guys now, if, if this was a vacuum and they were violent, I would say, you know what, if you're in if you're disrupting the ebb and flow of of trade and you're disrupting an entire economy now these truckers in in a week 
are bringing the economy of Canada to its knees, right? Because 25% plus of their uh, exports and imports come through uh, that border, the borders. Uh, and so you've got the borders in Michigan and they are penalizing them. And now you got the border in, in New York as well. It's brutal, right? What's going on now? The response is even more brutal. So these people are standing up for freedom in the face of tyranny. And now we're seeing the tyrannical powers reveal themselves once again. These are the same tyrannical powers that are trying to undermine uh, the innovative asset class of cryptocurrency. Now imagine if the truckers unite and they do the same thing from the US and they accumulate themselves on the US side of the border because we're seeing this all over the world. They're saying enough is enough and they hold the power because they hold the power to the movement of goods. You know, so imagine, imagine that, right? This is the ebb and flow that you can't centralize the control of the supply chain. The supply chain is privatized. So the governments can try to governmentize the supply chain, but it isn't working. And Canada is a perfect example of that, you know? So, and think about this from a, a crypto perspective. This is like, this is the movement of goods. It's like the movement of money, you know? So it's, it's, it's amazing. So we've got the pillars of corruption, <laughs> blockchain, the Badshaw, you got morning. Good morning. Good morning. So let me scroll down. I know I kind of uh, really, uh, man, cough, coffee in Dominican Republic. Yeah, the DR has got some good coffee as well. So let's see. The whole world needs the U.S. for cl crypto clarity. Even the other countries are maybe in the right direction. I, I agree with that. I think the U.S. definitely you know, holds a significant place uh, within the uh, full uh, regulation or clarity or movement of, uh, of asset uh, around the world. The U.S. is definitely important and instrumental, and that's why we got to get them on board. Um, but that's also why 2022 is so critical, right? So the midterm elections uh, in the United States are critical to the outcome of this innovative asset class. So very, 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 very important. And you know, we have to think forward, uh, you know, to 2024, how critical that is. And we're seeing the, the inability of a government unfold and the notion, and I don't want to get into this conversation about what's going on over in the Ukraine, uh, but we've heard five years of nothing but Russia and Ukraine. And so, oh, hmm, big surprise, right? So um, th that's a whole different show to get into that conversation, but uh, keep your eyes open, stay vigilant about what's happening, understand the dynamics and the movement of money and the movement of politics, because there's a lot that goes on, right? So, uh, Darren, could you imagine uh, what the media would be saying about the truckers if we didn't have the internet? Now, the media is already saying it, <laughs> so we, we know exactly what they're saying, and it's horrendous. The things that they've said about these truckers, they've called them Nazis. They've called them, uh, you know, they, they've, they've uh, called them insurrectionists. They've labeled these people up, and all those are probably bad words to say on here right now. But the things they've, now, could you imagine if they flip the narrative and imagine if they start shining a spotlight on cryptocurrency. Can you imagine if they take that same narrative, right? Let's say we all get very outspoken the way it had been with the uh, infrastructure bill and everyone was very, very outspoken about uh, and calling the senators and saying senators were, you know, and then they, because the phones were ringing off the hook, it held up the infrastructure bill for like two or three days. Now imagine what happened with the truckers happens to people within the crypto space. Just imagine. Imagine being singled out as anarchists, as anti-government, as anti-American, as anti-patriot, as anti, you know, whatever, whatever country you're in. You become the epicenter and the focus 
of the international government bodies to say crypto is bad and you're going to be singled out. Now imagine that, right? So this is the SEC with Gary Gensler, obviously, and this potential uh, potentiality within the executive order that was brought up earlier, uh, what could happen with the executive order. That's exactly the notion, right? So if you get outspoken and the blockchain companies and Ripple and FTX, so imagine now if they said, hey, you know what? No, these guys are trying to impede the flow of money. So RippleNet and Ripple all of a sudden becomes the bad guy in the US, right? Bitcoin becomes, that's what they tried to do, right? So you got to pull this into perspective and we have to really look at things and understand every aspect of what's happening. So when they singled out uh, the entire space, whether it was Janet Yellen or Elizabeth Warren or uh, the Shermanator, and they get up there on their high horses, and their ivy, their ivory towers, and they look down on the little people, and they start pointing fingers, and they castigate, all right? And they look and they say, cryptocurrency is only used for nefarious purposes. Bitcoin is used by criminal entity, by those that want to hide their wrongdoings. They're using cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. And then come to find out that we see a couple that we talked about the other day that get $3.6 billion worth of Bitcoin confiscated. Now, if all that happened in the dark, A, how did they track them down? How did they know that they were involved in the theft and, and trying to uh, launder all of that Bitcoin? How did that happen? And then if it did happen, how did they confiscate $3.6 billion in Bitcoin if it's only used for nefarious purposes by criminal entities and cannot be tracked or traced? Then how did the government get a hold of it? Big question. So now we've already seen the tidbits. So the fact that they can single out what's going on with the truckers is the exact same way they tried and tried to single out those within the cryptocurrency space. And they put the henchman, the enforcer, the pillars of enforcement and the enforcer himself, the cop on the beat, Gary Gensler, right? So you have him up there in his ivory towers talking from his living room, you know, with his fireplace and all of that stuff. And yet we see what they can do. We see how they've singled out different entities, different people. If you think different than them, if you look different than them, if you believe different than them, then you're the bad guy. And they're, they're going to single you out and try to label you as a bad guy. While at the same time, they pass false narratives through deceptive practice, through control of the media and the outcome, through control of the, of the social media and the blocking on social media. Why is it that Chip and I say that many times, uh, even here, you know, we, we see you know, the flow get cut and we see the slowdown in the flow based on maybe we talked about the wrong thing or we said the wrong thing. And we've seen others get shut down. We saw AI shut us down completely midstream. We've seen how they've come after Joe Rogan. We've seen how they've come after many. We saw uh, Thinking Crypto, Tony from Thinking Crypto, his channel got shut down overnight. And they said, well, it was AI. AI did it. We, ha we have no control over it. AI did it. Now, how nice to hide behind AI when we know that they think the same way Where in, in any of the big tech organizations, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or, you know, or, or the big G or the YT, you know, where we are, you know, so this thought process runs rampant. We know what they think. We know what they're capable of doing. And we know how they're singling out these poor truckers up in Canada through a, you know, it's amazing. So we put it all into perspective. <laughs> put it all into perspective. So Sam Ross, appreciate you.
Um, I bet they can track BTC or retrieve funds. Guess who developed the protocol? You know, we all wonder, right? We all really wonder who developed that protocol. <laughs> what exactly happened? Who's behind it? All those other good things. So there we go. All right. Uh, oh, look at this. Uh, oh, van life still holds a CDL, no medical card, which means I can't drive for a living, but I can drive privately. There you go. Hands loaded. Oh, yeah, thank you. That's why we're that, <laughs> that's why we're doing this morning. What do you guys like? Saturday morning, Sunday morning. I can do Sunday mornings instead of Saturday. If you guys like Sundays. But then we have the show Sunday night. That might be too much. Might be overkill. But let me get to two things here before it's too late. Number one thing that I want to get to. See how we can pull this up. Hang on. Why does that say remove? Here we go. So this was Ripple, their business trends uh, beyond 2022. Sam Ross, well, SHA256 was developed by <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Hmm, wonder. So uh, let's see. So the new value, crypto trends in business and beyond. You know, this is, so we got the tokenization, the managed moving compliance. Uh, conclusions. So I like this, how they open. When we look at, out across today's finance landscape, we see a tremendous amount of change. This isn't potential change or projected change. It's actual change. There are many factors driving that change, but this report focuses on the role of key blockchain use cases like payments and DeFi and the token types often referred to as digital assets for those use cases, including cryptocurrencies, central bank digital currencies, NFTs, and more. Right. So the evolving Internet. Look at that. Look at that growth. Browse, email, search kind of grew, got to a certain share purchase gig economy and the tokenized manage and move. Look at that. Where, look at that growth. Web point one, web point two or two point oh. Web point three is the Internet of value. Massive growth. It's going to be bigger growth than in web one or two. So it can be big. Terms are evolving along with the tech, the internet of value, Web 3.0, the metaverse. These are related and overlapping names for the new decentralized approach to managing value. That's big, right? Uh, decentralized approach. I like it. Tokenize, establish the digital representation of value on the blockchain. Manage, wields tokenized value through actions such as holding, hedging, staking, lending, borrowing, and more. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? I should have done this a lot earlier. Meant to do it. Sometimes you can't remember to do it. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell notifier. All right. All right. Uh, manage wields tokenized value through actions such as holding, hedging, staking, lending, borrowing, and more. Sends value from one place, person, or organization to another. Moving money. What a thought. What a thought. So... The big picture, there are high expectation within institutions for wide scale adoption, impact of blockchain tech, crypto, central bank, digital currencies, uh, tech and assets are maturing, more enterprise leveraging them in various ways, which is great. More consumers understand both crypto and NFT, blockchain based use case and the related benefits continue to multiply at a rapid rate for institution, governments and consumers. I like that part because there's no stopping it. Cats out of the bag. It's growing faster than the internet. I know you guys can't see this. I should have been zooming in a little bit more, but anyhow. Specific tokens, NFTs are rapidly introducing consumers to blockchain and crypto, uh, but the NFT consumer experience is not easy. Obviously, we know it's difficult and expensive if you're using Ethereum. CBDCs have gone from design to reality. Uh, there's 80 of them right now. Uh, for blockchain and payments in particular, CBDCs will add to the work already being done by crypto and stablecoin. Hints of finance leaders across both financial institutions and enterprise are seeking, are again seeing tokens, including crypto, as an even more powerful force than the foundational blockchain tech which drives them. Crypto, right? Tokens and blockchain appear to follow a usage pattern with exchanging, holding, and sending payments being the first wave of activity. 
followed and accompanied by more sophisticated scenarios supported by enhanced programmability. Man, this is this is really massive. I mean, you think about this is kind of Ripple's, you know, anticipation of what's going to be happening here moving forward and the mainstream mainstreamization, let's call it, of the crypto space, of the NFT space, how it's moving into general public. So as much as the SEC wants to push back, they can't. It's out of the bag. The Asia Pacific nations, the Latin America nations, the Middle East, Africa, and Europe. But North America, hey, they're trying with the U.S. It's because of who we have in, you know, in power right now. Put something, uh, someone else in power. There's some very vocal voices in Congress, as we know, Tom Emmer, Warren Davidson, amongst others that are getting louder and louder and louder. Green blockchains such as XRP Ledger do exist. Okay, let's skip that. Tokenize. Tokens, otherwise known as digital assets, are the avatars of value on the internet of value. Wow. When you represent value in a token, meaning in a digital form that is managed on a blockchain, you give that value new capabilities, including a rare combination of transparency and privacy combined with astonishing agility and decentralized security. Look at that. This is what the SEC is pushing back against. This is what they are resisting. But it's inevitable. They can't stop it. It's moving faster and faster and faster. The growing interest of NFTs is massive. Massive. $10 billion worth of NFT traded in 21. The value of the metaverse is growing. We'll see where that goes. We'll see if it's exciting or not so exciting. Maybe it's the gaming world. Maybe it's not. You know, who knows where it's going? There's a lot of opportunity. They think that it's going to be massive. Maybe it brings all the gamers together. Maybe it does something else. Who knows? Functional versus emotional NFT benefit. Obviously, there's a lot of emotional, but look at all the functional. Now, NFTs, obviously, we can see that like movement of real estate. Uh, there's a lot more with the NFT space. I think NFTs will grow. Uh, there's, we're just seeing kind of scratching the surface. Music, collectibles, gaming, sports, arts. Not even talking about real estate yet, but physical and digital experience. Uh, what's holding it back? Well, the barriers to entry are the expense. Way too expensive. Way too expensive. Way too complicated. I mean, it's 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 ridiculous. Forget about this sustainable NFT. That's a, a narrative we don't need to discuss. Smarter people will figure out how to make it more efficient at some point in time. But will consumer NFTs endure? Who knows? NFTs, are, are they a fad without substance or will they be an enduring and important part of our everyday lives? We believe that the current complexity and confusion that surrounds NFTs will give way to greater simplicity and understanding. And this will clear the way for more individuals to feel more directly and emotional value. The emotional value of the, uh, uh, NFTs. But NFTs in business, yeah, right now, the barrier to en entry of the NFT is, is astonishing. The cost of trying to move Ethereum is outrageous. It's outlandish. It's not just outrageous. And then you try to get into some of these NFT games, and Jim and I are doing it's like, oh, it's, it's like you know half an Ethereum to buy an avatar. It's two Ethereum to buy. It's only a, a 1.5 Ethereum to buy an avatar. What? What? It's like a five thousand dollars. Yeah, I'm just gonna throw out my Ethereum and get one of these NFT avatars that I don't even know if you're gonna be around a year from now, and you're just gonna crash and burn. And I'm gonna send one of my Ethereum's over there. Let me dabble and a hundred bucks. Let me get an avatar for a hundred bucks and play your game. <laughs> and let me dip my toe and see if it works. Instead, you have the NFTs. They don't even have the rest of their uh, the rest of their uh, solution in place, and yet people are buying avatars for. <laughs> ridiculous amounts of money, not even knowing if that NFT, if the company's just going to disappear and go away. I mean, it's amazing when they go up in value. So expected adoption. I don't know. I mean, this is, this was really, really, you know, amazing. Great, great study. 
that Ripple put out, just looking at the overall, you know, sustainable currencies, whoops, CBDCs, uh, carbon XRP ledger, you know, what they could use, Hyperledger, Fabric, Corda, Ethereum, using the CB, you know. So overall, it was it's really, really, really cool. You know, I'm just looking at this report and seeing how they're discussing it, you know, and it's really impressive to me. I mean, it's just like, you know, amazing, you know, what they see, the vision of where the, where everything is going. And, you know, I'd, I'd have to be remiss here uh, to not mention um, Ledger City. So let's uh, put that in the stream, the Ledger City, because I said I would talk about it. I said that I would talk about the Ledger City. So before we do that, uh, let me do that one. Look at that. Ledger City. We'll talk about it for a minute. But uh, Sir John brought up graphics. Well, you can't register for another week. So seven days from now, you can register ledgercitygame.com. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be any good, but it's kind of cool that they're building in this direction. The Ledger City is a game powered by XRP blockchain. By owning crypto, you own real estate, experience true ownership of digital assets. So somehow your ownership of XRP will allow you to own real estate within the Ledger City to start out. Um, so it is a push into Ledger City. Now, I wouldn't say these graphics are like all inspiring in any way, shape or, or of uh, the word here. But like you got the, the panorama. You kind of see their uh, their their platform here, what they're building. I don't, I don't know. If that's what it's going to look like. You know, like I said, you know, it's not like, oh, these are the most amazing graphics ever and i'm playing this video game and it's it's great but you know this is it's interesting right i mean look at this it, it, they're not actually bad avatars here this is what it's really going to look like i don't know i mean people play uh minecraft and love minecraft sometimes i don't want great graphics and i think great graphics have taken away the simplicity and the fun of playing video games sometimes but here he goes, the account, XRP 10,551, and they have the big tower and your XRP holdings, you'll own real estate in their game based on your XRP holdings. And not sure exactly everything that's going to happen, but you get to the game and uh, you'll be able to register. You can kind of uh, read some more about it. If you already own XRP, you already own property in Ledger City kind of cool um so yeah i mean the the graph to me i i'm happy with it you know if this is what it really looks like hey you know it's gonna be very cool i don't know if this is what it's gonna look like but again how cool is this as an idea um check it out uh, you'll be able to register a week from now i don't think it launches until april or something like that i don't know exactly but what a cool thing i've reached out to them to see if we can get the ceo of ledger city uh over here on the chain would be very cool you can get a ledger city duck on the solagenic decks uh, that's what brady uh, uh mecca is saying go check it out you can get it for 123 xrp um over on the solagenic decks you can start getting ducks uh, uh jim d says my concern about ledger city is it's a backdoor way to ky xrp wallets via yeah i don't know um that so that's something we gotta got to look at. I like that. Definitely got to worry about different things like that. So glad you brought that up on the KYC. Uh, Hydropolis Jim D, if you set up a charitable remainder trust, you don't have to worry about taxes. Oh, that's interesting too. Uh, that's a different conversation. Uh, so we just did. <laughs> Sorry. So anyhow, um, I'm over the time. You guys were amazing. You know, we had about 200 people on this morning, on a Sunday morning, on a kind of a you know, we're supposed to stream yesterday, but looking forward to talking to you guys again. But we will be back here Tuesday. We're not going to be on tonight. It's Super Bowl uh, uh, weekend, Super Bowl tonight, Valentine's Day tomorrow. So everybody enjoy two days off from on the chain. And we'll be back here with you guys uh, over here on the chain, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 
Tuesday, and we do stream six days a week, uh, Sunday through Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and typically every Saturday at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. But if you guys like Sunday mornings, maybe we'll push it. I, you know, I don't know. We'll have to figure that part out, see how that one works. But you guys are amazing. Why? Because we have the best and the brightest, the smartest in the crypto space that gather here six days a week on the chain. We have the best community. Looking forward to you guys. And we will be rolling out a way for you guys to support on the chain right here through YouTube. Uh, we're working on that. You'll have some unique uh, uh, avatar uh, and some unique recognition as a supporter and member of on the chain here on YouTube. You can also support us from the website. And we are going to roll out a, um, a meetup, uh, a digital meetup. So Chip and I need to work on that. And we're going to talk about dates for the digital meetup. And it'll be amazing. Um, and then we've got Berserker, 8 a.m. Pacific time, 8, 9, 10, 11 a.m. Eastern time, right here, not on the chain, but right here on YouTube, I should say. <laughs> but Berserker coffee time at 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Go check out Berserker. Berserker. So that's all I've got. That's all you've got. And we'll check you guys out on the next one. I'm out. Are you down with OTC? Please like, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when the next video drops.